Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our event, Navigate the Internet of Things, live stream here from the Telstra World Class Customer Insight Center in Sydney, Australia. Telstra extends a warm welcome to all our participants globally online. We have over a thousand, a thousand of you joined us. Welcome. And to our live audience here in Sydney, Australia. We'd like to extend that welcome to our sponsors and partner, the Australian Computer Society. It's great having you here. My name is Angela Lovegrove, and I'll be hosting the event for you. We have the most incredible lineup today. We have a full house, and there are over a thousand people online. I'm, uh, I'm personally excited about today's panel. You're going to hear from leading technology pioneers such as Uber and Kevin Ashton, and you're also going to hear from our entrepreneurs about the Internet of Things capability and how businesses will transform from IT to IoT, and that means information technology to Internet of Things. Please post on social media if you have not done already. Hashtag Telstra Virtual Events, hashtag IoT, and hashtag Telstra IoT. Let's make the forum trend. We'll also be sharing video highlights package to everyone who's attended today. At Telstra, we're looking to innovate and provide thought leadership. So it's with special excitement that I'm pleased to welcome Mark Chapman, Director of Mobility. Mark will provide an update on Telstra's Internet of Things roadmap. Straight after Mark, we will be joined by Richard Moorcroft, who will be moderating our panel. Richard will lead us uh, with the IoT panel and our special guest lineup. Richard is best known for his two decades as the 7 o'clock news presenter for ABC Television. Please put our hands together and wel welcome Mark Chapman to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Angela, and welcome, everyone. I look after a team of about 50 people in Telstra, and our collective vision is transforming Australian business through mobility innovation. Increasingly, the Internet of Things and the technology that goes along with it is a pivotal component of our strategy and the tools that we're going to use to actually realise that vision. Now, the incredible panel that we've assembled for you today is going to take you through um, the, give you the opportunity to explore some of these topics in detail. But what I wanted to start with is just give you a sense of what Telstra is doing and how we're thinking about IoT and how we're going to participate in the market. Now, normally in a talk like this, I'd be starting off with some Gartner stat that says there's going to be 50 billion connected devices by 2020. I'm going to start somewhere quite different. Um, could we roll the video, please? I bought my own screensaver. This is a fish tank, but it's not just any fish tank, it's my fish tank. It's actually uh, sitting in my living room in suburban Geelong. Now, keeping tropical fish and corals alive in uh, suburban Geelong environment is actually a bit of a task. And the way that I've gone about actually succeeding in this is by assembling my own control network using stuff like this. This is a little uh, wireless Arduino. I sort of started from scratch with these boards, built up protocol stacks, running it off Raspberry Pi services, yada, yada, yada. And uh, it took me years. So why am I telling you about this? What, how is this relevant to the conversation we're having today? What excites me about how the technology is changing is just how fast I would be able to do this now. So yesterday, starting with hardware and building up code stacks from the ground up, tomorrow, being able to use innovative platforms using technology that's broadly available so that we can turn this round in a couple of, um, couple of days. In terms of how the world's changing from my perspective, it's increased accessibility, faster time to market and much deeper insights through bringing data together from multiple sources. So in the context of accessibility, we believe that by 2017 we'll have cellular devices that are as cheap and run off a battery as well as low power devices. So today people are connecting off Wi-Fi, low power networks, 802.15.4, etc. Um, 
we think that having a very low cost cellular device is a game changer because it means anywhere where there's mobile coverage and you can stick a battery, you can run an Internet of Things device. In terms of time to market, by the time we get to May next year, Telstra will have deployed a platform in partnership with a company called Cumulosity. And what's cool about Cumulosity is it'll take the data from all of those sensors, consolidate it into a single point, and it basically does data visualisation out of the box and translates these kind of systems and technologies into an active software development. So previously, if I were to design a new technology for a new customer, I'd have to go out, I'd have to find a hardware manufacturer, I'd have to um, engage a system integrator and put in a whole heap of effort into bringing that to life. By the time we get to the start of next financial year, we'll be able to use, engage with a software developer community and actually build these applications in very short amounts of time. So, to that point, I'll just speak quickly about the City of Adelaide. We just recently ran a proof of concept off our Cumulosity platform where the Adelaide City Council was actually interested in environmental monitoring for planning purposes. So, what's the street level environment like? What's the carbon dioxide levels like? What's the noise like? Are the neighbours going to be complaining about pubs in this particular location? We partnered with a technology partner called Liberium who had the actual devices and we were able to prototype up a functioning system with two or three days' work out of our chief technology office. So just to give you the sense of the speed that we can actually take these things to market. And it's going to be everywhere. Whether it's industrial internet, whether it's smart cities doing um, building and environment modelling, whether it's smart cars, um, we're going to find that there's opportunities everywhere. But for our customers, it's not just about the technology. In fact, it's not about the technology at all. It's about being able to transform their businesses and make them more efficient and um, basically build a better quality of life for Australians and Australian businesses. So whether that's in agriculture, improving yield because you're actually able to measure um, parameters from the environment, or whether it's disruptive business models, so usage-based insurance being able to totally change the way that we insure our vehicles based on our driving behaviour, um, we'll be able to improve multiple facets of life with IoT. Now, what's really important for me in this discussion is when I talk about IoT internally in Telstra, I don't talk about it like Telstra is actually going to own the intellectual property of, of IoT. We're here to create an ecosystem, but when I talk to our internal stakeholders, I say the innovation isn't happening in here, the innovation's happening out there. And our role is to help foster it, build it, nurture it, and allow as many participants in the Australian market as possible to transform the business lives of their customers. Um, and we do, we're starting to do this through running engaging events um, run by our Chief Technology Office into the market, but we're going to be putting a lot of effort and energy into developing links with developer communities to help us really start driving this market in Australia. That's all I wanted to cover by way of introduction. I'd love to get now straight over and invite our panel out and invite Richard Moorcroft across so we can actually get on with the substance of what we're here to talk about. So welcome, thank you for uh, spending the time this morning and enjoy the rest of the session. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mark Chapman, for the introduction and the warmest of welcomes to Telstra's Navigating the Internet of Things Q&A panel in partnership with the Australian Computer Society. Um, as Mark mentioned, I'm Richard Moorcroft and uh, I am delighted to be your moderator for today's discussion. And hello to our online audience as well. Uh, thank you for attending today's live streamlining event. Now, just before we begin, uh, I wanted to cover just a few of the practicalities for our virtual attendees. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets that you can use. And if you have any questions at all during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. Uh, we're going to be uh, answering some of those questions during the webcast itself, but we will also 
be capturing all the questions and will collate responses to be sent out via email after the event. Also, you can uh, use this um, to send in any technical issues that you might experience. Now, the highlights of today's forum will be captured and included in an information pack with further materials which will be available to all participants after the event. Um, and you can also expand your media player by dragging the bottom right corner of the boxes. So have a look at that too. Now, let's get underway by welcoming our guest panellists for today's forum. And first off, a special welcome to Kevin Ashton, the technology pioneer who co-founded the Auto ID Centre at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which created a global standard system for RFID and other sensors. Uh, Kevin is also very much a founding father in this area. In fact, he is the one who actually invented the name the Internet of Things to describe this field. Kevin is also the creator of Wemo and co-founder and CEO of Zensi. Next up is the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Computer Society, Andrew Johnson. Andrew is passionate about developing, promoting and implementing professional standards while providing, at the same time, benefit to the Society's member base of over 22,000 professionals. And of course, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we are delighted to be partnering with ACS for today's event. Welcome also to Naomi Hen, who is a delegate for the World Economic Forum. Uh, Naomi was a finalist for the I Awards Young Innovator of the Year and also a finalist for the Young Australian of the Year. And our fourth guest is Glenn O'Sullivan the Sydney lead for Uber. Glenn joined Uber in early 2014, just prior to the launch of UberX in Australia, and is currently running the Sydney operations. His career started, with the help, I might add, of an ACS Foundation scholarship in an IT role in finance, and then over the years his focus has shifted from server rooms to bringing technology to everyday life. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you please give a very warm welcome to our panel. Now, the Internet of Things is not, a, it's not a new notion, but it certainly is a lot more powerful and a lot more pervasive today, and it is growing rapidly. IoT capabilities and technologies are changing the social, the economic and the business landscape globally. Uh, but perhaps let's start just by clarifying the Internet of Things definition. If the Internet of Things is not necessarily part of the Internet, as we know it, then why is it called the Internet of Things? Maybe we could uh, start with a quick definition, logically from you, please, <laughs> Kevin. Thank you, Richard. Um, so it's not, it's not when your refrigerator talks to your toaster. Um, if anybody knows what a refrigerator would say to a toaster, please tell me, because I would love a punchline <laughs> to that joke. Um, in, in the 20th century, uh, computers were new, and computers got their information from keyboards, and they typically displayed information on screens. Um, so they were sort of intermediaries between, between uh, our fingers and our brains. Um, uh, in the 21st century, things are, are very different, and... Uh, Computers are more and more gathering information for themselves, by themselves. Um, so they, they know things without being told things, and they can make decisions about that information without human help, and they do it through a combination of sensors and the Internet. And uh, Uber is a, a nice example. U Uber knows where you are because of the GPS sensor in your phone. It knows where the driver is because of the GPS sensor in his or her phone. It uh, uses the Internet to put those two pieces of information together. So that's a nice little example of the Internet of Things in action. Well, I was, in fact, going to ask Glenn that very question uh, about the process of, uh, you know, how businesses can transform from IT to IoT. And in the case of Uber, we've heard from Kevin then uh, an example of some of how that works. But how is that transform transformation central to your business? I think it comes out of um, just a need for something. I mean, our story is that um, you know our founders were in Paris 
five odd years ago. Uh, it was raining, they couldn't get a cab, and they just thought, oh, how great would it be if you could pull out your phone, which is already connected to the internet, press a button, and then someone would just come to you rather than you having to go out and, and find that car. So it was sort of born out a little bit of necessity and, and convenience uh, and then just built from there. Uh, so I, th I think sometimes it's a little bit difficult to think, you know, how can, we, how can we take our business and apply, you know, the Internet of Things concepts without doing a little bit of experimentation and just having to think about what is it in our everyday life or the everyday life of our customers that they, they want. They want that convenience for, they want that extra level of value delivered through the everyday things in their life. And what do you see, Naomi, as that, uh, as that process of everyday value that we've just heard in that transformation? Well, I think for any business, they should look at how they can leverage the Internet of Things um, and focus on creating almost an unfair advantage by leveraging the online and offline, um, but look at both sort of fundamentals of the business. So look at how it can change your processes, but also look how it can change the product that, you know, what Glenn touched on is that, that need, that um, <coughs> unique offering. Um, and I think that it's, it's very important to look at um, not just how we can collect data or change the way we, you know, reduce, you know, reduce and increase, you know, our efficiency, but look at the end product for the customer as well. Um, and Andrew, in terms of the practicalities of that, you know, we've heard some of the, the concepts behind it, but in terms of the, the practicalities of transformation for companies, what do you see as those necessities? Uh, I agree with Naomi. It's really about experimentation and understanding your customers really well. Um, the internet offers up tremendous opportunity. I was picking up my eight-year-old from a party on the weekend and uh, talking to her father, her friend's father, who was showing me his new pool being built. It was magnificent. But what was he focused on? He's getting a touchpad, connecting his spa bath that he can turn on half an hour away from home. Um, so that's taking out the friction. You're not wasting time heating up the pool when you get home. And how can you have some fun and get people happy? So that's a, a delightfully practical example. Um, but we also, of course, uh, have our online audience today and uh, we're starting to get online questions coming in. Uh, one of the first is from Kashif, who has asked, what are some of the most exciting companies in Australia working in the field of IoT? Who'd like to kick off with that one? We've heard about the practical example of, uh, of Uber already. Um, but uh, any suggestions uh, from our panel on companies that are doing an exciting job at the moment? Yeah, um, look, I'm, I'm certainly um, probably not the expert. Well, one company that's caught my eye is uh, Ninja Blocks, and they've been around for a, a little while. Um, they build small sensors to integrate in your home that give you that sort of intelligence of what's going on at home and then allow you to you know, use your phone or use the internet to connect in with those. So, it might be, um, there might be light sensors, um, there might be sound sensors, so you can get an alert if you hear a window breaking. Um, and connecting, connecting those so it's easily accessible, so you can feel, you can get more information out of your home, whether you're there or whether you're on your way home. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I'm really interested to see where that sort of small sensor-based uh, integrating into the existing home will we'll, uh, we'll take us. Uh, so, yeah, it's certainly a company in Australia that I know of that's, that's doing really interesting things in this space. Kevin, do you, uh, do you have some Australian company knowledge? I love, I love, uh, I love Ninja Blocks. But uh, on the user side, actually, um, uh, uh, funny enough, Alcoa out in Pinjara, um, uh, where they, they strip mine bauxite raw material for aluminium, um, have the largest fleet of self-driving vehicles in the world right now. They have a couple of hundred eight-meter-high trucks that uh, drive themselves around to make the strip mining more efficient. And uh, with the greatest respect of the people in Pinjara, it's also a place that not a lot of people want to live. So it solves the problem of uh, hiring people to go drive the trucks. So there's actually um, there's a lot going on in Australia right now. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the one of the first uses of Internet of Things technology ever um, was right here in Sydney in the, in the late 1980s when uh, buses on Sydney Harbour Bridge used a technology called RFID for the first time. 
um, using technology out of Adelaide. So there's a lot in Australia. There's a lot happening here. And um, Naomi. Um, just from a, like a, a kind of separate point of view, not focusing really on the home, um, but just the way in which we interact from, you know, from going to an event, from you know, a sports you know, game day. Um, and I think most Australians have experienced going to a game before. Um, but there's things that are happening that we're not even aware of that are changing. Um, for a simple example, um, you've got BLE in all, um, moving into now all stadiums across the country to... Um, when there was this amazing um, uh, presentation at the AIS that we were at last week um, about Populous is another example for Australian company um, that's looking at um, the Internet of Things, um, but from a, you know, getting people to a game, getting people to have an experience or a moment, um, that's looking at, again, what I touched on before, looking at how we create better products, not just processes inside companies, um, and, you know, getting, you know, a beer delivered to your seat and your payments using RFID within the stadium. Like, every interaction that you have without noticing um, is being changed by the Internet of Things. Um, even getting to, to and from game day using, you know, your Uber integration. Um, so there's some really interesting innovation also in the, the giant, you know, corporate companies or stadium companies um, around the globe that we don't necessarily think of um, that is there, down to you know, the Ninja Blocks example as a really great you know, Australian company. So, yeah, interesting things happening at the moment in the Australian scene. Indeed, and, uh, and I think another example uh, of, of a company in Australia that's uh, doing a lot of work in this direction is Coca-Cola Amatil, uh, where it's uh, M2M communication uh, between headquarters and various vending machines has quite a sophisticated feedback process which can even personalise the interaction with individual credit card using customers who might be repeat customers and actually be recognised by individual machines. So uh, some intriguing possibilities there. Uh, we've got another question uh, come through from our online uh, audience. And uh, Marco has asked, what would be the most critical bottleneck regarding skilled IT professionals? In your opinion, what kind of IT specialists would be required the most by 2020? So we're looking a little to the future uh, with Marco's question. Uh, but um, skilled IT professionals, uh, maybe you'd like to kick off with that one, Andrew. Uh, thank you. We've done some work recently on economic modelling with Deloitte Access Economics and uh, some of the forecasts that, that will have a shortfall of 100,000 IT professionals in the next five years. Um, so when you say skills shortfalls, it really is about how we introduce people into the sector and reskill, retrain, um, knowing that the school system will take a while to, to output. Um, in terms of Australia, we've got two million businesses. Um, the vast majority of those are small to medium businesses. Um, people don't do things the same way. Um, so having multi-skilled professionals and being able to transform businesses on their unique journey is a, a requirement. So some of those things that we see, you can't do it all yourself. So increasing consultancy skills, how do you liaise, work with, partner with a whole range of um, vendors, for example, get the result that you need. Um, they are some of the soft skills, the, the thinning out of org charts, technical skills, having a greater connection with your customer interface, um, increased communication and the like. Um, so that will happen and continue to happen, and obviously big data, as we're talking about, is only going to get bigger. So how do you crunch the numbers? How can you use information systems to get the information that you need? Um, and, uh, Kevin, as you travel the, uh, the globe uh, discussing many of these issues, in terms of professional skills, what are your observations about the increasing needs for people's professional development? I think the, um, the the big opportunity, assuming Marco is a is a is a young man uh, thinking about his career, is in in data science. My my advice to anybody at the uh, high school or somewhere in high school and, and graduate school level, uh, if you want an amazing career in technology right now, um, get into data science, which is not quite the same as programming. It's the the ability to to write algorithms basically equations that will uh, look at large amounts of data and output decisions. It's a very interesting field. It's a very challenging field. Um, and it's one where there's a real lack of, uh, of skilled people to hire right now. So it's, it's a great opportunity. Let's um, perhaps turn now to how companies are successfully 
commercialising IoT capabilities. Uh, what is that process? How does it happen? How does it happen best? Would you like to uh, um, kick off for us uh, with that, Glenn? Yeah, <clears throat> pardon me, sure. Um, we um, probably started with that as the core of our business. Uh, wouldn't have, um, you know, we wouldn't, wouldn't be around today if we didn't have the iPhone, if we didn't have Android phones uh, and ready access to, uh, to, you know, to internet connectivity in those. But I guess we, we are always conscious that we can't just say, oh, okay, well, that's sort of set and forget now. We've, we've got this technology. Let's just leave it, leave it alone. Um, it's about experimentation and finding out what are some new things that we can bring our existing or new technology to. So um, you, might, you might have seen some of the sort of uh, the, the one-offs or like the occasional uh, special, special sort of events that we run just to challenge ourselves and think, what else could we use the internet and we could use these devices to deliver? Uh, so a fun one that we run every year around the world is delivering ice cream at the push of a button. Uh, in Sydney, it's a, it's a global event. In Sydney, that happens to fall within the, the dead middle of winter. Uh, I think last year it might have been raining, uh, but Sydney was still one of the biggest uh, ice cream delivery cities around the, around the world. Uh, and it's, you know, people, I think a lot of people are interested to see what can I, what can I get with more convenience, with more immediacy, um, without having to walk down the street in the rain. Uh, so. For us, it's, it's about, you know, we, we did start with this sort of Internet of Things based business. It's about continuing to challenge ourselves on what we can do next with it. And, you know, I, I'd suggest it's probably true of many businesses. You just need to sort of think, what can we experiment with for a day or a week and see what ideas that generates on, uh, well, that generates, rather than we need to make a giant leap into this and double down. Uh, that's a, a great and, uh, and very entertaining example of. Uh, of ice cream delivery at the touch of a button, but looking at, at perhaps larger scale commercial opportunities, um, uh, Naomi, uh, you were talking a little earlier about companies really leveraging these possibilities. Can you give us a sense maybe a little more of what you see as the real commercial opportunities in this technology? Um, well, I think the first thing is when companies do different partnerships and different you know, collaboration is when we've seen the best integration of Internet of Things. And I guess that's quite, that's quite interesting to have a look at um, because there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of different companies that are traditionally quite hesitant to do you know, M&A deals or, or, or strategic alliances in the early stages, especially in the tech scene. And um, now that it, we look at the ones that are succeeding and the ones that are growing faster than other, in, other companies or competitors, it's due to that collaboration um, and the ability to then grow like geographically. Look at, again, with, we keep going back to Uber, but look at how quickly it grew. And it's because it has the right you know, partnerships, the right growth, the right strategy internally from the beginning, using Internet of Things as one of its core you know, components, not just an add-on. Um, so I think one, one thing is looking at different strategic alliances. Um, the second thing is looking at you know, platform type companies or platform type partners, because then again, it's much more pragmatic. You have an existing ecosystem you can plug your product into. Um, and on that as well, then it opens up to more, you know, more data possibilities. And I know people keep throwing around, you know, collect data, it's really important. It, you know, it will help your business. Um, but I think what people don't understand is that, one, you need to be like, what are you collecting? Why are you collecting it? How are we collecting it? And then um, you know, look at what does that then tell me about my business that I can implement now as low-hanging fruit? And then you know, longer term, my strategy. Because for data to be really worth you know, a lot of money and a lot of leverage, it can take you know, five years or, or whatnot. So, with Internet of Things and leveraging possibilities, uh, I think people should look at more you know, cooperation and, and collaboration rather than um, the traditional sort of mindset of, of how we win in business. So, Kevin, how well are companies around the globe understanding the possibilities uh, and, uh, and actually putting into commercial effect this potential? Oh, 
mean, some are doing it very well and, and some are not, like, like all things. But I think the, the, the challenge is to, to get out of the old 20th century paradigm around information. And um, I agree with, with Naomi that the notion of collecting data, for example, collecting is the wrong word. You really want to be sensing data uh, and, and acting on it immediately. So um, the old paradigm of data was, was maybe it was keyboards, maybe there was some barcode scanning, everything went into something called a database. Um, there was some system, uh, it was SAP or it was Salesforce or it was something, and you could output something called a report, which typically means something like a spreadsheet, um, and then people would look at that. And uh, often it would be turned into a pie chart, and the pie chart would go on a PowerPoint slide. And, and a few weeks later, there'd be a meeting, and people would look at it when they weren't looking at their phone. And, and that's business. That's not business in real time, right? That's business in outlook time. You're going as, as about, you're rate limited by the, the, the least available person on your outlook calendar, right? So you know, you're, you're giggling, and I'm glad, because that's a really horrible way to think about data processing. In the 21st century, you want your information system to gather information by themselves, act on it by themselves, tell you things you need, need to know when you need to know them. And the benefit of that is efficiency. And efficiency sounds like a really kind of meh, boring word. But what it means is doing more with less. Um, and we, you know, I started mentioning Uber. Let's just continue with Uber. Uber makes it possible to find a ride more quickly. So it saves you time. That's, that's doing more. You, know, you get your ride with less less time sort of standing on the street corner. And wherever you are in business, whatever business you provide, there's something you can sense automatically that will make your business more efficient. So, uh, so in practical terms, how can actually businesses better understand the data that they're tracking and deal with it efficiently? What, what practical things do they need to do so there's not that big awkward lag time? It has, to, it has to happen automatically, and that comes back to you know, the importance of data science. And it can sound big and complicated, but it needn't be. Um, it might be as simple as you, know, there's, you have field service personnel, or you have employees, or you have customers, or somebody in your, 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 sort of, um, your, your business world uh, has GPS on them, and, and you need to know where they are. And you could have a a developer write an app that accesses that GPS information and, and shares it with some system that does something with it, tells them to go some different place. Um, it, it, there's a, there's a, a thousand things you can sense very easily, uh, and every business needs to know one of those things. And the trick really is to roll up your sleeves and try it uh, and avoid the temptation to, again, to use you know, Naomi's phrase, and she's right, to collect data. You don't want to be collecting data, you want to be acting on data. It's interesting, uh, Kevin, that you mentioned that phrase, rolling up your sleeves and trying it, because um, I'll just go back to the uh, Telstra Internet, th uh, Internet of Things challenge, which uh, Mark mentioned briefly in his presentation uh, a little earlier. Um, that'll be running later this month at uh, Telstra's newly launched Garawa Innovation Lab in Melbourne, and that is all about thinking how to connect things more efficiently when they might only need to send perhaps just a few bytes of information. Um, Telstra is going to be building a, a, a very different kind of wireless network in the Melbourne Central Business di District, which is optimised for all of the things that don't send very much data. And along with the City of Melbourne, there is this competition to build a whole range of, of interesting or useful or maybe just entertaining uh, things that connect to it. So um, if you're interested in that, uh, just put um, Telstra Internet of Things Challenge, perhaps, into your search engine and check it out. Uh, now, we've got uh, some more material coming in from online. Um, <laughs> here is a nice practical example from Heather uh, online. Um, Heather says, I can turn on and off and alter the frequency of watering using the app on my mobile phone. It's a great party trick when people are on the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Heather. A uh, great party trick when people are on the lawn, but also a great time saver and can be connected to weather stations for auto-adjusting. So, uh, great example there. Uh, and a question from um, Sobash, uh, who has asked, what is the current value of IoT in Australia and in the world? 
uh, un un assuming perhaps he's talking in economic terms rather than the, the very broad terms that we've been discussing so far, um, anybody have a, a sense of the, you know, of the value uh, economically of IoT at the moment? It's like uh, if you know um, the Austin Powers movies and Dr. Evil sort of goes like this. <laughs> It's a bajillion dollars. Um, it's a very hard question to answer, and one of the reasons is it's hard to know what to include and what not to include. But it's, it's definitely in, in the, the billions in Australia a year and uh, in the many hundreds of billions worldwide, um, largely because of these, these incredible efficiencies that we're seeing. Whenever you see somebody using the Internet of Things, um, you find that there's a real transformation happening in terms of how much they can do and, and, and how little they need to do it, which is the, by the way, the overarching uh, sort of benefit of the Internet of Things in the 21st century. It's an ability to, for the first time in human history, really um, separate inputs from outputs. So it used to be that if you wanted to make more of something, you needed to consume more time, raw materials, labor, land. Um, and, and now, because of very sophisticated Internet of Things information technology, you can do a lot more with a, with a lot less. So the, the financial value of that is, is really enormous. Andrew, do you have a, a sense, if not actually dollars and cents figures, do you have a sense of the, uh, of the IoT value in this country? Uh, no, I agree with Kevin. It's what do you count, what do you not count. So in terms of the digital economy, we might say anywhere between 75 to 100 billion, um, but that obviously doesn't count when we're talking about sensors and information systems communicating with each other. Um, the whole notion, um, so no, I don't have a real dollar cents value. Um, what I would say is the economy is rapidly transforming. And uh, that's out of necessity. Um, all the guys have talked about need. It's not so much internet of things first. It's about where's the gaps in the market and, and how can you address uh, a need. And right now, the globalisation is, is, is here. Uh, it's come in a big way. You look at what Alibaba's done, bringing the Chinese SMEs to the global marketplace. Um, things aren't staying stagnant, and you need to embrace change and technology as a way of sustaining your business in the future and looking for opportunities to, to um, excel. So you, you just used the word future. Let's uh, shift our gaze uh, for a moment. Quite a few years down the track, what is the future of IoT in um, in 10 years, in 20 years' time, a couple of decades. Um, can you paint a picture of where you think we might be, uh, given the degree of transformation that's happened so quickly? Where might we be in two decades, Kevin? Um, well, it's, first of all, I think it's worth thinking about how long two decades is now. I mean, 20 years ago, um, there was no Wi-Fi. Uh, there were no very few cell phones, really no smartphones. Um, there was no GPS. There was, you know, it was the beginning of the internet. We were all excited about the World Wide Web. I think, uh, you know, Milli Vanilli or something was, was what was popular. It was a, you know, young people in the audience don't know what I'm talking about. But um, so 20 years out is, a, is a, a lot will change. I mean, one of the easiest predictions I can make is that, you know, you're probably less than 15 years away from buying your first self-driving car. Um, and self-driving cars are an Internet of Things technology. Uh, and that, that one change is, is radical. That, that has in, enormous implications for your time, your safety, where you can live, uh, eventually how land gets used in terms of, of road use and, and so on. And it will, you know, your, your grandchildren will laugh at the idea that people used to drive their own cars. Um, so that's just one, one example. Um, and there will be many others. But it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, 20 years is a really long time in technology now. But, Glenn, as you look towards uh, 10, 20 years out to the future, do you see this as being something that will have been a complete revolution in the way we live and interact, um, or just a slow technological change? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to being pleasantly surprised, and um, it, you know, if, the best I can hope for is to have some small part in that. I think the thing that excites me most about this sort of technology starting to interact more and more with everyday objects and everyday tasks is the, you know, to go back to that efficiency point, using technology to get more time for things that I don't really need to be doing, that I'm not necessarily adding a lot of value to, whether that be hailing a car. If I can just press a button, fantastic. I then have five minutes to do something else, uh, whether it be doing my taxes, you know, we have applications now that will scan your 
receipts as you get them. So rather than having a big shoebox of receipts come tax time that you need to fossick through, it's all there. It's, you know, the, the text from those receipts has already been read. Uh, so the more, the more things that we can have in our lives that save time, I think that's really exciting and I think there's a whole lot more potential, uh, whether that be hitting a button, having your spa turn on rather than coming home and sitting there frustrated waiting for the, the water to heat up because you're distracted. You're not going to be able to be productive necessarily. Um, huge, huge number of applications for yeah, our lives just to be a little bit easier and, and you know, be able to reinvest that time in our family, our friends or our hobbies uh, rather than being the interface or the admin interface to, to those bits and pieces in our life. You're nodding, Naomi. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting point because just on that, um, multitasking is something I see that will, will really change and that's due to the fact that we have these different smart devices um, that are now changing the way we do everything. Even just at the airport, you normally have your ticket in your back pocket, you're trying to you know, carry your, your, your suit jackets and you're doing something else, you can't look at your phone or figure out the gate. Now with your smartwatch, you can be oh, you know, I can check where I'm going. There's, there's just different areas of things that you couldn't normally do before. Um, but that was you know, a very you know, basic example. But multitasking is something that will change dramatically um, due to the you know, ability actually for efficiency, but also focus, um, which will be, which is really important. Um, but I think what you know we should take a step back and actually have a look at is that you know Internet of Things is you know it's it's not just you know, different devices we wear, it's, it's everything we do. It's you know, smart TV, it's smart cars, it's you know, everything we do will be completely changed. And it's something that I think is just really exciting to see because what I see is you know, a world that is so much more efficient due to these, you know, these connective devices because you know, I still look at the world and I don't understand why there's a 106 going down the street of Perth when no one's on it. And it kind of frustrates me because we have the capabilities today that buses should just come like they used to, pick up the kids when they're going to high school, drop them off on the way home. Like, we have these capabilities now. And, you know, you're going to the game day, there's so much congestion waiting in a queue. It will be automatic, it will be seamless. You'll have beacons coming in, I know where to pay. I'm, I'm paying, you know, the grocery store at the moment, you know, you have, um, you're already doing it with Amazon where my milk's out of the fridge, it orders it and delivers it to my house. Um, I go into Coles now, I have to, you know, buy whatever I'm buying and, you know, scan. It will be, it will be seamless, everything will be seamless and um, it's exciting because with that comes time for more innovation, comes time for more efficiency and um, lack of, you know, better, no waste. Um, you know, smart cars, the moment, there's just so much pollution and waste. Um, so it's exciting to see where the world will go. Um, but on that, I think it's really important to look at not just, you know, a trend like payments and how it will change everything we do, but also a trend looking at, you know, the next frontier people talk about. And you know, everyone looks to, you know, Richard Branson and, you know, SpaceX and what Elon Musk is doing with space travel. Um, and I think that's phenomenal and I think that you know, that's you know, a great movement to see and we'll have people on planes, you know, doing their, you know, they're already doing it with, you know, Virgin Galactic. Mm. But what mm. I think is... A, a, a very practical and, and a very positive uh, vision for the yeah. future and, and really interesting to hear those mm. examples. And we've got another question uh, that's come in from um, our online uh, audience um, and I'd like to perhaps uh, put this one across to you, Andrew. Um, Rob uh, online has asked, how do we find which companies are playing in IoT uh, to be able to build relationships with them? Well, the easy answer to that one is obviously Google it, but again, it comes back to <laughs> what, is, what is the need? Um, so data is everywhere. You're able to find out who's doing the new cool things, but most importantly, you need to be able to interrogate and find out how it's going to fit into your supply chain. So this is all about reducing friction, and um, the, the marketing pieces are one thing, but you need to get roll the sleeves up and start to test ideas and, and work with people through concept stage and, and then taking it, piloting it, and then taking it to market. Can you add to that one, uh, Kevin, in terms of finding yeah. those companies, the best approach? Um, 
What was the name of the person asking the question? Uh, Rob, I think it was. Do we know where Rob is from? Uh, it doesn't say, I'm afraid. Okay. So, uh, Rob, anybody. Um, I tell you, one of, the, one of the really cool things about the IoT space is pretty much everyone in IoT uses a web service called meetup.com. Um, so there's a very big, for example, Internet of Things meetup group here in Sydney. Um, there's one in New Zealand. Uh, there, are, there are several in other cities around Australia. So uh, I, one thing I would recommend uh, if you want to learn more and find companies that are doing things, go to meetup.com, find your local Internet of Things meetup. Generally, there's a meeting every month or so. Go along, get to know people. Very quickly, you'll find that you understand pretty much everything that's, that's happening near you. Great. Very practical suggestion. Thank you very much. Now, um, it's wonderful to uh, have our live audience here in the auditorium, and now there is an opportunity, if some of you would like, to put a question or two to our panel. We'd love to uh, give you that opportunity. Uh, we have a couple of microphones, so if you would like to just uh, pop up your hand, indicate that you'd like to ask a question, uh, please do wait for the microphone to get to you, and then if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and uh, putting your question to the panel. Who would like to uh, kick off in this, in this direction? Yes, the gentleman just down here. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Uh, great session so far. Um, you've been talking... Sorry, My name's I... Charlie MacDonald. I work for Telstra. Um, we haven't really talked about industrial applications. I'm really interested in the industrial Internet of Things. And how do you see manufacturing sector adopting uh, these types of technologies? And Kevin, you nodded your head very vigorously oh, yeah. there. Let's uh, start I, I'm with disappointed you. disappointed that you think a bauxite strip mine in Pinjara is not industrial enough for you. <laughs> um, I think it's a great question. And, and this, is, this is one of the challenges talking about IoT is that uh, a lot of the benefits happen somewhat behind the scenes, which is you know, why I say it's not, it's not your toaster talking to your refrigerator, but it might be how your refrigerator gets made or it might be how the raw materials in your refrigerator get made, which... Um, you know, we, we are uh, sort of live at the front end of this enormous supply chain, which is very complex. So I think, um, you know, a lot of the most powerful Internet of Things applications we are seeing right now are happening in manufacturing and in logistics. Um, and some of it is as simple as making sure you, you know, have everything you need to make the thing that you're trying to make. Um, and, and some of it is about you know, doing automation, like the, the Alcoa example that I gave you before. Um, now, the interesting thing about that is a lot of it's kind of invisible. And a lot of supply chain and manufacturing process have been automated for a very long time. So if you think about um, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, there were a lot of car commercials where you saw the robot making the car. The car companies were very proud of the fact they had a robot arm making your car. right? Um, and that robot arm had sensors, but it wasn't connected to anything. It wasn't connected to the Internet. So the question for people in uh, sort of industrial applications and manufacturing applications is not uh, what do you do with sensors or what do you do with automation, but it's what do you do with connected sensors and connected automation. Um, and, and one of the simple answers is it's the ability to coordinate things remotely over a very large scale. So, for example, if your production schedule is dependent on a shipment of more raw materials arriving, you know, if you have sensors in those shipping containers, you know where they are, you know when they're likely to arrive, you can schedule your production more efficiently, and so on and so on. So a lot of the, the most interesting and powerful applications we're seeing today are actually behind the scenes. Uh, and you know, they have things to do with stuff like freshness in the food supply chain or integrity of the food supply chain, for example. Um, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with connected cows right now in, in the cattle industry, and some of it's happening in Australia. There's also Internet of Things enabled sheep in New Zealand. So, uh, yeah, it's a good question. It's happening all over the place. Well, from, uh, from connected cows, um, Andrew, uh, any other examples that you might know of um, in the Australian industrial arena? Uh, not, not immediately, but I think the future is it all can be connected. The question is, at what point do you pursue that connection to make sure that's financially viable? Um, so the supply chain is, is the real one. Um, and again, taking out friction, making sure that your customers get a seamless experience. If you know exactly what you need when you need it and, and have full confidence that that delivery will happen, um, then you're, you're going to be in a good place. Glenn, what can you contribute here? My um, 
my I haven't you know personally spent that much time working in the you know manufacturing. I've done a little bit um, with some agriculture companies, but uh, my dad actually did a lot of work in um, grocery supply chain efficiency. And something that I hadn't really thought about until you know we we discuss it was how do you actually bundle up all the tiny little costs that go into a product, and not just the raw materials, but the cost of taking a pallet off a shelf in a forklift, um, the cost of someone actually putting that pallet into a truck, unloading it at the other end, um, is something that's not, it's not always easy to work out what all those little costs are for, a, for an individual SKU or an individual item. Internet of Things technologies can help you get that level of understanding of what that cost is to serve, produce, you know, deliver at, at, a, you know, at a pretty minute level. Um, you know, if you've got an RFID tag on every unit and a reader on your forklift, you can have that point where it scans as it picks up that pallet. And then you register what the time is, and you can calculate how much fuel you put into the, into the forklift, or how much electricity you, know, you, you, put into the, you used with the forklift, to the point where you drop that pallet on the truck or in the, in the loading point. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to think about all those points in supply chains where you could put some sort of sense, sensor technology, feed that information back in, and understand every logical point where there is a handoff in the supply chain and manufacturing process to work out what are those costs, what are the time. Uh, and you know, once you have that, then work out what can we do with it. Is that the, is that the shortest? Is that the most effective way we can do it? Uh, so that, you know, it's something that I get a can of Coke, to use the Amatil, uh, the Coca-Cola Amatil example, I get a can of Coke, it's delicious. I don't really want to, you know, I don't need to be thinking about that, but when you start to break down what did it take to get that can of Coke in that vending machine at Central Station, uh, you know, it's a fascinating thing to, to, to step through. Mm. And those step-by-step -step processes, as you say, can each have useful components. Yeah, fascinating. Um, our next question from the audience. Yes, uh, gentleman here. Thank you. Ali Shariot from ACS. Just hold the microphone a little closer, thanks, sir. Um, Ali Shariot from ACS. Um, as we go through this Internet of Things and collecting many information from devices, how do we ensure the balance of the privacy and efficiency? Uh, we know that there are shopping centres collecting every information of the, of the phones that you hold and where you're going, same as the traffic lights and things like that. Have you thought about what the, how the government keeping up with the laws in those? Privacy regulations. Kevin. Um, yeah, I'm glad you said regulations. There's, there's, a, there's a policy piece and a technical piece to, to privacy. And the, the technical piece is, is security, right? It's making sure that if I promise you no one's going to see your information, I can't keep that promise if I can't protect the information and keep it secure. And there are always better ways to, to provide uh, security to, to data and there are always people trying to find ways around them and, and that's an ongoing process. When it comes to, uh, to privacy, um, there's a couple of parts. I mean, one is everybody should be given a choice, right? Do you want to share this information? And if you do, who are you authorizing it to be shared with and, and what for? Um, one of the challenges with choice is uh, obviously the choice needs to be well informed. So a lot of people are sharing information today that they, they don't know that they're sharing. And uh, one, one good example is every time you take a photograph with your phone, uh, it's almost certainly uh, capturing location information from your GPS sensor. So you post that online, whether you realize it or not, you're posting your location. There's a wonderful website, I recommend it. It's called IKnowWhereYourCatLives.com, <laughs> where somebody has scraped all the information from cat photos around the internet, and you can find cats near you. Now, the point is, most of those cat owners have absolutely no idea that that information is available. All they knew is they posted a cat picture. So we need to do a much better job um, as technology providers of helping people understand what choices they are making when they use our technology. Um, now, the, the other piece of that that's really interesting, though, is you know, privacy is something um, that I want for myself, but the question is, what privacy do you want to give to other people? So, for example, that connected cow, do you have the right to know what that cow eats if you're going to eat the cow? What information should you have access to as a consumer of beef? Uh, and guess, guess what? The, the, the beef industry don't necessarily want you to have any. So there's another side to the privacy 
debate, which is not how do I protect my privacy, but what information should be freely available about, for example, the food that I consume. So it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing discussion, but it has to start with people understanding what they're sharing, and, and that's a, a big grey area right now. And Naomi, you were uh, referring earlier to that kind of constant and seamless flow of information, but where, from your perspective, does privacy sit in that? Um, well, I won't reiterate those, those points that you mentioned. I, I can't agree more. But um, what I think is with privacy also comes, you know, there's always you know, two sides. So with that comes the need for transparency. Um, and I'll go back to that cow example. It's almost looking at you know, what, is, what do we want to be private and then what also do we have almost a right to, you know, to see or to understand. Um, and then there's other people in the industry who want that to be private as well. Um, and looking at how that will be tracked, even with the very com like complex scenario of you know, supply chain, um, I believe that that will become, and, you know, will become much more normal to have that as public knowledge, to have that also as a whole new dimension of what is, you know, what was private is now almost public because people want to track um, you know, the ownership of the car down to property rights and that will become, you know, I honestly believe based on the whole blockchain movement um, and that is, you know, one of the solutions and will be one of the solutions to understanding, um, you know, tracking processes and tracking a new kind of look at security and you look at privacy um, and, yeah, if you have a look at just even women's fashion and, you know, authenticating, you know, what clothing comes from what. Um, that will become public knowledge. Um, so there will be a lot of things that aren't as private as what we have today, um, but it's just important to kind of understand those trends as well. Very important process. Um, actually, would either of, uh, of you, Andrew or Glenn, like to add to the privacy discussion? I, I think you learn from, unfortunately, disasters. So it's, uh, I agree with Kevin, we need to educate. Um, but the reality is, I don't know about you, when I get terms and conditions that go onto three and four pages, my ability to absorb all that information and understand all the implications, um, generally I'm judging, going with my feet, saying, no, that's a, an experience I want, so I'll sign off now. <laughs> um, and over time, you, you'll find out whether that was the right decision for you or, or not, um, based on, on, on mass population. So there's always going to be that period of catch up. Um, we will learn along the way, um, but I think what we're seeing is a comfort level to be a more open society and people's notions of privacy will change over time. Can I just ask, I want to ask yes, Glenn, please. Glenn a question on this point. What does Uber keep? I use Uber, right? So <laughs> does, does Uber keep information about where I've been and when? And if so, why? <laughs> We, um, you know, as, as with most transactions with businesses, there is a record. Uh, one, so you, 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 know, you know what happened in your business. Two, so you can improve on efficiencies. Um, but, you know, it should only be used for real business purposes. So, you know, Uber does collect a lot of data, um, but it's very closely guarded. And who can access it needs to be for a specific, person, a specific purpose um, and in an anonymised fashion so you can... You know, if we, if we want to look at how many people were picked up in George Street and work out how we can make that a better process, we'd look at that on aggregate. Um, if, you know, you had, you've lost your umbrella in a car, mm -hmm. we'd be able to go and look at that for you on a sort of individual basis. How, how long do you keep it? So in terms of um, how long everything's kept, um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you that exact answer. Um, but, you know, we want to be able to, for, is say, for an a, umbrella. Is, so, uh, and this goes back to my point about being informed. Is there a way I can find out as a, as a customer? Uh, yeah, you can have a look at our terms and conditions. The long terms and <laughs> yeah, conditions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that change every once in a while. Because I mean, that's an interest. That's the other thing about, and not to pick on Uber, I, I really love Uber. I travel all over the world, and it's incredibly useful. But um, all, the, all the stuff that a company retains, this is the other point, is, is vulnerable to government subpoena. So one of the things I'm agitating for a lot right now, and I'll agitate it for it right now with you, is you know don't keep this information for too long, right? Because no matter how secure you make it, no matter what your terms and conditions are, if, if the government comes knocking with the force of the law behind them, they can force you to provide it, right? But if you don't have it, 
you have a good excuse. So that's the other thing for companies is, is think about data retention policies because the tendency is right now is just to keep it forever because you can, but there may be a good reason to throw it away and that's privacy. It's a very, uh, a very practical point uh, that you've made there and a, and a really interesting practical example to have brought up. Um, now, that actually brings us to the scheduled end time for uh, this Navigating the Internet of Things forum. Um, however, we have a number of questions that have come through on our online or from our online audience, and they particularly and logically extend from privacy into security. And I know that we're really keen to try to spend a little time talking about security. Um, so the panel, I know, have graciously agreed to stay with us for a few more minutes, and I hope that you, our online audience, can also stay with us uh, a little bit longer because you have in particular indicated that you would like to have a look at this area of security. Um, around about 40% or more of the questions, the total questions that have come in uh, online are based around the question of security. What are the main issues around security with IoT and who actually is governing that process of the security of the information. Um, Glenn, we just heard a little about your, your practical example from your own company's point of view, but broadly, how do you perceive that security question? Yeah, it's um, safety and security are things that you really need to invest heavily in and treat as a, a top priority. Um, and it's, I think, part of the reason that there are so many difficulties with it, and you have, you know, some public examples, is that it's, it's very complicated, and it's, uh, it's a different mindset to try and secure every single piece of your business compared to maybe one person who wants to, uh, you know, is that's their sole focus. They want to, they want to sort of compromise. They want to find out uh, something uh, that they they shouldn't necessarily have access to. So, I think it's when you know when you go to market with a product and when you're planning out how you're going to develop a product or a service, just integrating that thinking into every step of the way is the best way to, to you know, do every single thing that you can to make sure that you're protecting, uh, whether it be yourself, if you're putting sensors into your home, like we talked about a few different products, you need to sort of have a bit of a think, like, what is, what is this device? What does it do? What could it say about me? And, and am I comfortable with that? Uh, so, you know, whether it be a sensor that, you know, flips on a, or a piece of technology that flips on your lights before you get home, you need to think about, is that something that I really, really want? Yeah, it is. And what are the implications of that? Maybe somebody could, if they wanted to, flip on the lights for me. But, you know, just thinking through what are the implications as you're either buying a product or building a product. Naomi, you um, uh, made some strong comments in the area of privacy. But in that slightly different area of security, where do you stand? Um, again, I, I kind of look at things more from a customer point of view. Um, and I think which is important to acknowledge is that what we want to keep private will be something that also changes. And um, looking at how different people have interacted and, and sort of analysing what people are now actively sharing, um, people are becoming more... Like immune to sharing more, which is, is interesting. And it now looks at, is that going to become a major vulnerability, looking at that CAD example? Um, or is it something that, as a culture, will actually change our mindset as to what we are OK with sharing? Um, and with that, it could come more transparency and more innovation and more you know, a different way that people think. Um, however, it's important to acknowledge that you know some things we do want to keep private and to be more wary and you know, as a community in general you know, different education around how we should and shouldn't be sort of interacting. Um, I think some new norms will, will come and um, just the way you know, messaging applications are now being built. You know, messaging applications, you know, the, the next, you know, one of the biggest industries in the world and there's quite a few now that messages automatically dissolve, not just Snapchat but actual messages. So I think from a, compu um, a customer, you know, consumer um, side two, that different applications will emerge and different mindsets will emerge as well. And some of those uh, new norms, those new mindsets, uh, Andrew, may require perhaps new legislation. 
uh, government involvement in, in one form or another. Uh, Kevin brought up the, you know, the possibility of government wanting to be able to access information. What are your thoughts in that direction? I think technology is changing so rapidly that um, the concept of regulation is good. People understand that certain um, information needs to be protected and security should be looking after that. Um, but I think pragmatically, while technology continues to rapidly evolve, and as a professional body for IT in Australia, we focus on ethics and what are the current ethical conundrums and how do we ensure that IT professionals are using information appropriately. So they're getting access to more and more data sources. Um, so we have two different areas in security. Obviously the individuals with access to information that, that is private and then the technical aspects to make sure that systems can't be um, navigated um, from external sources. Um, so we push very heavily a, a code of ethics and what does ethics look like in today's environment and that will evolve over time. Um, the legislation piece is always going to play catch up would be our, our general view. Um, but just on that security aspect I, I think um, from an ACS perspective, we're really keen to see a greater investment in IT security. We're always going to be a net importer, a small economy of technology coming in. So how we add value higher up the food chain, how we bring systems together, um, it's critical that we have people with the right skills to, to make that happen. Um, so IT security and skills development in that area should be a focus for the country. Uh, Kevin, as you look very closely at, uh, at all of these areas, whether, as you say, whether it's you know cows talking to each other or whether it is... Um, uh, the data on your last Uber taxi ride, um, some of that process of security may need to have government or legislative intervention. Again, from your more global uh, viewpoint, where do you see the development in those security processes going? Well, <laughs> the government has a real conflict of interest when it comes to your information security, by the way, because uh, a little bit like the privacy comment I made before, um, they, they would quite like to know everything, uh, just in case, you know. Um, they don't necessarily want anybody else to know everything. So, um, and, and one of the interesting challenges we have now, actually, uh, is that uh, government is less and less able to police technology because technology is global and technology is complicated. Um, and so I think uh, there's, there's, there, are, there are limited things that government is going to do, national governments are going to do to protect uh, our, our security. What, what's going to happen instead is as we become more informed uh, consumers, whether that's at the enterprise level or the individual level, um, uh, the market will start to require certain things around security uh, and, and will require certain warranties and, and uh, and uh, look, look to sort of sue people who don't, don't secure data from, in products that they purchase and so on. Um, on the Internet of Things specifically, there's always going to be a security arms race, but one of the vulnerabilities right now, just to be aware of, is that the, the sensor technology at the edge, whether it's your GPS device or your, your Bluetooth in your phone or an RFID tag in your... Uh, you know, your ID badge that gets you into your office building or something, uh, they all have vulnerabilities that in the security world uh, we call promiscuity, which means they'll pretty much talk to anything that asks them a question. They might not give up all their information, but the typical data transaction between uh, a sensor at the edge and, um, and, a, and, and the system that it's designed to communicate with starts with kind of a hello, how are you, uh, to which the sensor will always reply. And when it replies, it gives up a little bit of information. So one of the things we're seeing is a, a, the sort of the frontier of security and information in, in the Internet of Things right now is finding a way to lock down um, the, the, the way something like an RFID tag communicates so that it's not talking to an unauthorized interrogator. Um, and when we solve that, there'll be another problem on the other side of it. You know, security is it's never something you can achieve. It's only ever something you can strive for. It's going to be an evolutionary process by yes. the sound of it. Yes. Um, and uh, we have another question from our online audience. Thank you to Anand. Uh, and Anand uh, has asked this question, um, in fact, on the topic of governing. Uh, are there any standards established by Standards Australia and or ISO on IoT? Do we know whether there are standards established by Standards Australia? I can't speak to uh, Australia, but I can tell you there are 
so many standards all around the world, um, most of them completely useless. Uh, and it's an interesting thing. So um, th there are parts of the system where you need clear standards, right? And uh, wireless communication is one. So if you think about something like um, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, uh, those are well-established standards. There were people in committees who, who developed those standards and continue to improve them, and they, they publish a document. Uh, and that's essential. That, that kind of physical layer communication between devices needs to be well standardized. The good news is we have most of the standards we need in that area. Uh, the even better news is as you get higher up the, we call it the stack, but the, the food chain in information systems to things like data and applications, we live in this wonderful post-Google world where you don't really need standards anymore. And I'll explain what I mean. Before Google, uh, web search was a little bit like going to the library. There are a few people here who are as old as I am. You will remember Yahoo. When Yahoo was how you searched the web, well, how did Yahoo work? It was a classification scheme. There were people who looked at the web and decided this website belonged in this category. So that was a standards-like process. Uh, and then Google came along and said, well, we can do this algorithmically. We can, use, do, we can do this with machine learning, with data science. We can look at the web page automatically. We can make a guess at where it belongs in the search results. And then we can learn, based on whether people click on that search result, whether we got it right and we can improve. So in the, in the post-Google world, for a lot of the standards you need for the Internet of Things around data and applications, you don't need standards committees anymore. You don't need a Standards Australia or an ISO to intervene. Um, you can do things using algorithms, which turns out to be a much more efficient way to solve the problem. So my personal feeling is we have most of the standards we need for the Internet of Things, and in areas where we don't have them right now, uh, we don't need them because we can use algorithms instead. Thank you very much. And uh, another question now from our online audience. Uh, this is from Hervé. And Hervé has asked, if the Internet of Things leads to more automation, it will potentially reduce the number of jobs available across the supply chain. Uh, can the panel discuss their thoughts on the social cost of IoT? The social cost of IoT if jobs are reduced. Andrew, would you like to kick off? Uh, I think history through the Industrial Revolution hasn't shown that uh, increases in technology has resulted in a, a loss of jobs. Um, there are higher skilled jobs and people need to retrain and upskill. Um, that's been the general trend. I'd say perhaps now more than ever we have a real need to be concerned with how those jobs are then spread globally you know, in a global marketplace. They might not be as even as they might have once been, but uh, I think there's massive opportunity. We're all talking about efficiencies, more data, more output, um, growing economies, lifting standards of living. I think the real question there is, is the equity um, issue of how that will be distributed. Um, but I don't believe that technology will result in a loss of jobs in the foreseeable future, um, but we'll see how artificial intelligence plays out. What are your thoughts, Naomi? Um, I think, well, I initially thought that um, artificial intelligence, it, it's a machine learning, but like a human, it's, it needs to keep learning. So it needs um, you know, some elements. For example, there's a software um, that's the Watson software that came to Australia, and it was basically you can go through you know, 200 different you know, documents and websites and whatnot and figure out the you know, consultancy example or you know, for professional services firms. And it was just showing how that could work as a scenario. And that but what they also found is that it can go through all these different pages and updates and newspaper articles and any way you want, but like a human, it needs to keep learning and keep being trained. Um, so there's that element to it. So you cannot remove you know, all human interaction um, and it would just allow innovations to occur more because the more mundane tasks um, won't have to be you know, for humans to do. And then you have you know, more efficiency and you know, f further upskilling. So there's that element. But at the other side, um, there's some interesting articles and um, theories that you know, Elon Musk and, again, Richard Branson is quite strong about advocating um, the, the kind of the, the things that are quite scary looking at where artificial intelligence can go. Um, but, again, we just have to have trust that people in the power of these companies and organisations and um, 
you know, do the right thing and, and can actually use it for, for good. Um, but it is an area that I find really interesting and I do believe that you know, the next frontier won't be space, it will be mind. And it's just looking at how we educate and continue to use these, you know, um, the software and, and the community for the right, for the right reasons. And Glenn, um, do you have trust, as Naomi has just said, in, uh, in those organisations that will be using this information in the future? And, and just going back to that, um, the, the social cost potentially through job losses of, of uh, the Internet of Things. I think, um, I think the exciting thing about technology <laughs> in general um, is what new opportunities it unlocks. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of been touched on a little bit here. Just because technology maybe takes on some of the roles or parts of the roles that, that we would otherwise be doing, that doesn't mean that's, you know, that's the end of it. Oh, well, you know, there's, there's no longer a need for, for those skills. Maybe those skills are adjusted and used in a different industry or a different part of the industry. So, um, you know, there are infinite businesses, you know, not infinite, but a very large number of businesses that exist now, which only exists because of the technology that, that has been developed and the innovation that's happened that didn't, you know, it's just a continuing, continuing evolution and new industries keep popping up. So I think, the, um, I think the thing that can be of concern is how quickly things can change. And I think those rapid shifts uh, in technology are sometimes hard to keep, keep up with. But I think, you know, looking, looking a little bit beyond that sort of, uh, as Andrew was mentioning, upskilling or changing your skills and adapting with the market, I, I think in general is a pretty exciting opportunity, even if there are some, you know, a little bit of friction along the way in, in making those transitions. And Kevin, uh, a, a final thought from you on perhaps potentially the social cost, but also in a broader sense, the social benefit and indeed the business and economic benefit of the Internet of Things. So uh, there won't be fewer jobs, there will be better jobs. Um, and as Andrew rightly points out, that's been the, the trend with automation throughout human history. Um, when information technology got started in the late 1700s, early 1800s with automated looms, that led to everybody having to learn to read. That's why we can read. We can read because of automation. Um, our great-great-grandparents could not read, typically. So uh, it's, a, it's a very positive thing. And, you know, more generally, the challenge we face as a species is an increasing population with ever longer lives, with uh, ever higher expectations about quality of life. And we've always used technology to solve that problem. And the Internet of Things is uh, the latest and most exciting example of, of how we do that. It's, uh, it's basically how we scale the human race. So it's, it's very positive. We have a very bright future ahead of us. That is a great note on which to, to finish. Uh, a bright future ahead of us, and it has been a fascinating discussion on the Internet of Things. So would you please join me in thanking our panellists, Kevin Ashton, Andrew Johnson, Naomi Hen and Glenn O'Sullivan. And thank you uh, also for uh, our online audience who have stayed with us and especially thank you very much indeed for the questions that you have sent in. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available uh, about a day after the webcast itself. Um, and if you could stay online just for a few more moments now, because we'd be very grateful if you could complete uh, a short survey, we would love to get your feedback on how we can keep improving our virtual events and giving you more of what you find valuable. But thank you for joining us today. Now, back to Angela for a few final words. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Richard Moorcroft. Please put your hands together for Richard. That, that concludes the navigation, Navigating the Internet of Things brought to you by Telstra and ACS. For those online, we look forward to hosting you again at a Telstra virtual event. And those of you here, we look forward to hosting you here again. Have a great day. Thank you.